it's your turn. Okay, thanks for uh, for inviting uh, for share with me this opportunity in, in this great uh, session. It uh, has been amazing. Um, what does complexity tell us about ecosystem health and why it is important for future pandemics? Let me um, uh, start in the reverse order by posing uh, the following question. Are we entering into a pandemic era? Uh, well, that might be the case, but there is no doubt that we are already in a biodiversity loss era. And it is important because it is well established that uh, there is a strong biodiversity disease interaction. Uh, we are uh, now seeing a lot of, of work in this kind of, of, of uh, a path about zoonotic host diversity increases uh, in, in human dominated ecosystems. We also have this seminal work by Rodolfo Dirso, uh, The Foundation in the Anthropocene, uh, where he coined this uh, concept of the foundation to highlight not only the importance of biodiversity loss, but also uh, specifically the loss of uh, great anim uh, big animals. I'm uh, crossing the Anthropocene uh, world because for me, it's not an Anthropocene, but a Technocene. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that, but uh, leaving the link in here if you want to see why, why I, I make the difference. So in this experiment, Rodolfo Dirso uh, has two, two kinds of, of sites, one with, uh, with the presence of big animals and the other without the presence of big animals uh, due to the effect of physical barriers uh, in Africa. Uh, and so they, they saw some kind of ratification effect by the increase of rodents numbers and due to the dilution effect hypothesis that says that under high levels of biodiversity we usually uh, see low disease transmissions and vice versa. Uh, they start to thinking about zoonosis uh, because with this ratification also increased the number of ectoparasites and of course the pathogens. So they made some DNA extraction and detect all these pathogens in here. Uh, for example, a very nasty one, the Yersinia pestis, the, the Black Death. But why do some diseases evolve into pandemics and others don't, even when they usually have some wildlife uh, hosts uh, like these two guys? Uh, and we, we think that it might be because uh, all, all, um, although deforestation and deforestation are some main processes, we also have another component in order to, to pandemics to emerge. So we see that we have a hypercentralism that translates into institutional fragility and a low response. We also have a hyperconnectivity that translates into bigger rates and velocity of infections. And we somehow uh, package uh, modernity terms in te uh, thinking about technological hyper uh, coupling and the lack of classical uh, values such as uh, skin in the game that might uh, translate, for example, into comorbidities as obesity and diabetes that we know are very important uh, for COVID, for example. Uh, so there's a lot of components need needed to, to a pandemics to emerge in, in the modern context. Uh, but of course, loss of biodiversity and the subsequent rise of intonosis are some of the main drivers. Uh, in that case, we sure need to understand and to measure uh, biodiversity loss. And for that purposes, in Mexico, we have a construct an interinstitutional arrangement between all these uh, government agency that allowed to uh, to construct the Biodiversity Monitoring National Systems, the SNMB, uh, in which we collect a lot of historical data, field monitoring, uh, forestry data, and a lot of remote sensing information uh, that we process with cut, cutting edge the technology of machine learning uh, modeling in what we call the MADMEX system. Uh, so, but what we do, what we, uh, how can we make sense of all this data? For that, we think that uh, an ecosystem health framework is required. Um, and like uh, unlike many other modern terms in science, ecosystem health is a fuzzy concept that has been defined several times uh, since the late 80s, 
And this conceptual uh, diversity has led also to different ways of measuring it, and in turn it has generated a wide range of narratives related to health of ecosystems. Uh, we, I'm going to refer only to, to some of them, uh, starting with uh, ecosystem health as integrity, that might be considered some kind of uh, zero-order approximation, health as a state, pretty much as we think uh, health in, in human uh, systems, uh, it, um, in which we, we think a person is in health if these parameters falls into a very narrow uh, range of, of optimal values. And we have all, already understand that uh, ecosystems integrity arises from processes of self-organization derived from thermodynamic mechanisms um, that operate through the local existing biota and the materials at these dispositions. So these uh, self-organization uh, processes we think that occur in some kind of hidden unseen tier and then information flows all its way to an instrumental tier where we can uh, observe and measure a composition, a structure and function that could be the analogy for these parameters and, and so if we, want, we can assess these parameters for uh, an ecosystem that would uh, define the, the state of the ecosystem. Uh, so we have a lot of data from remote sensing, direct uh, observation, indirect observation, camera traps, bioacoustic uh, uh, signaling. Uh, we also incorporate citizen science and we use all this to, to feed a uh, Bayesian network model that calculates the probability that a pixel in the territory has the same variable configuration uh, as a reference site. Uh, and with this probability, we construct an integrity index that can be shown into a map, into a map for example. Uh, but in this exercise, we have learned a lot and we have discovered that there are some flaws in the national sign in the national biodiversity monitoring system, uh, mainly because the lack of sufficient uh, time frequency monitoring. So we are now uh, implementing a new large scale and long term eco ecological experiment in Mexico called the CIPECAM that uh, as its predecessors covers all the territory and covers also all ecosystem types. We are using a lot of uh, sensors to trying to capture the um, uh, all, all possible signals from the ecosystems, uh, incorporating, for example, new, new data for, uh, from environmental DNA experiments and uh, Sherman traps to try to capture these sonotic effects. Uh, we are also constructing some uh, technology, for example, mobile apps to collect uh, field data or machine learning models to the uh, species detections uh, because we are generating a uh, thousand or thousand of uh, bi uh, bioacoustics uh, files and thousand or thousand of uh, pictures and movies uh, with animals. So there, there's no way a person can uh, label if there's a, an animal in the in the picture or not, and what the species corresponds, so we need to this uh, this este, uh, in, in a, an automatic uh, way. We are also constructing some online platforms for data management, and uh, in contrast to the um, Rodolfo Diaz experiment in Africa, we are not using physical barriers, but uh, the dif different differences in integrity levels. So we have the sites with high integrity and a presence of big animals in contrast to a low integrity sites, defaunated sites. And with this kind of a pair was a arrangement, we can test a sonotic hypothesis. But we also have some interesting questions in terms of if, if integrity is a close model for ecosystem health, we think not because integrity reports the current state of an ecosystem based on its composition, structure, and function, but it is not a photo it, it is a photograph. It does not capture information about the, the dynamics, and so it may generate false negatives and positives. For example, in here you, you see an external state, a unhealthy person, 
But inside, for example, it, it, he, he may have uh, cardiac dynamics in health and brain activity in health. And on the other side, you may see this elite athlete that looks great in perfect uh, state um, uh, composition, but might have some cardiac uh, uh, disease and unhealthy dynamics. Uh, so a general problem in health is conceptualizing dynamic processes as if they were static. This has been pointed out a lot of times by Spiro Markidakis. So how to extend the idea of ecosystem health from a complex system perspective? Uh, we started with the seminal work by Goldberger that identified that um, uh, human physiology falls into this um, scale invariant uh, behavior uh, described by power loss. Uh, I added this uh, slide because uh, what we are, have been discussed uh, in the session, just to, to, to quickly tell that in physics we have this kind of um, scale compartments in which we, we have a complete and consistent description of nature, uh, but only in these uh, uh, scale regimens. So we have uh, an scale regimen uh, for classic uh, mechanics, for quantum mechanics, for relativistic mechanics, uh, etc. Et uh, but uh, complex systems occur not in, in a well-defined scale, but across a scale. So I, I, I think that maybe a scale invariance is the key and core feature of complex systems. In this case, for example, for time series, we have a scale invariance in the, in the, in the Fourier space uh, characterized by this power loss uh, that we can um, uh, package into three different types of regimens. Uh, one with the scale coefficients, for example, uh, very near to zero, where ran randomness uh, domain and is uh, characterized by a uh, low correla uh, autocorrelation, low memory, low predictability. Uh, in the in the in the other side of the of the scale, we we would would have a, a dynamic governed by order, uh, a lot of memory, uh, and in the in, in the middle point we see this critical uh, kind of, of dynamics that uh, we think uh, uh, code to complexity in which we see a balance between emergence uh, and self-organization. And uh, medical evidence points that health uh, falls in the, into this kind of critical uh, dynamics for human weight uh, dynamics, but also through uh, for brain activity, and so we have this criticality hypothesis which states that a system is in a dynamic uh, regimen between order and disorder, attain the highest level of computational capabilities and achieve an optimal trade-off between robustness, uh, order and flexibility randomness. Uh, but there are also good reasons why uh, living systems fall into this criticality regime and it has to deal with uh, th this necessity that uh, life has to, to not only to react to the, to the environment, but to, to, uh, to predict and to anticipate uh, to, the, to the changes in the environment. And for this, uh, uh, living systems need to, to, to make some kind of model. And, uh, and we know that under criticality, uh, uh, we have a maximum of complexity, also a maximum of official information, and then a maximum of uh, inference capacities. So we think that this is a very core uh, feature of uh, evolutionary processes. So we started using this idea, we started to think about measuring uh, ecosystem, ecosystem health uh, using criticality. Uh, for that, we made this analogy between physiological time series in humans and uh, environmental uh, time series, we choose to, to start with uh, ecosystem respiration time series that are measured using these edicovariant towers uh, that are uh, placed in a lot of different kind of uh, ecosystems in North America by the Medic Flux project. Uh, from their data, we construct the fluctuation time series and then test for a scale invariance and measure the uh, scale coefficients. And then we arrived to a better model with ecosystem health as 
as a function of integrity, the state, and criticality, the dynamics, but we think that there's uh, still something missing because uh, one main uh, process uh, in, in living systems is hemostasis. We know, for example, that in human physiology, there are variables that need to be uh, in, in hemostasis, uh, such as blood pressure, uh, and that need to uh, that um, are characterized by um, a normal distribution, uh, but in, in order to achieve this, the organism uses some other uh, physiological variable uh, to to absorb fluctuation from the environment. In this case, is a heart rate activity that is described by a right-handed fat tail distribution. Uh, this graph is for for healthy people. And when people for, uh, and when we uh, see the uh, data for for people with chronic diseases such as diabetes, we see that now uh, homeostasis is lost, uh, um, blood pressure uh, lost uh, the the normal distribution, and in contrast, it start to develop some left-handed fat tail distribution, and the absorbing uh, variable uh, is now. Uh, normally distributed, so we think that this is pretty much anti-fragility in action, uh, and that le leads us to to think about uh, how people uh, think about uh, the response of perturbation in, in ecosystems. So we we made a, a literature review to understand this, and that allowed us to introduce for the first time in ecological literature the idea of anti-fragility. We incorporated some ideas from Carlos Gershenson to measure uh, antifragility as the product of some uh, very universal payoff function complexity times the, the degree of the perturbation. And finally, we have uh, then an ecosystem held as a function of the state, integrity, dynamics, criticality, and the response of perturbation as antifragility. And finally, we are very interested in to assess uh, planetary antifragility. Uh, for that, we are following the work of Carol Michaelian, who, uh, who proposes that healthy ecosystems have a greater entropy production. And we know that entropy production is mainly achieved by photon dissipation. So the uh, albedo measurements should be a good indicator of ecosystem health. Uh, but we need to, to remember that beyond the absolute value of albedo or any other proxy for uh, entropy production, the real fingerprint of life and health is found in its dynamics, and dynamics is encoded in fluctuations, uh, which makes a criticality or fission information analysis a natural choice. In here, I'm leaving you a, a talk uh, from my friend and colleague in, in Citrus, uh, Yunam, uh, where they uh, analyzed uh, the fluctuation of um, climate data and uh, shows that the planet has been uh, losing criticality in, in the last decades. Uh, so the, uh, we have this uh, specific proposal to measure planetary antifragility, uh, calculating the Fisher information for time series of proxies uh, of, um, uh, of entropy production. And we are uh, working in this a, uni a more general framework that um, trying to to establish the link between criticality and antifragility, and we think that link is fisher information. And pretty much that's uh, what I wanted to talk uh, to you today. So thank you for listening. I don't don't think I think that may might be have some time for questions. Thank you very much, Oliver. Uh, very good talk. We unfortunately are way, are way into the, the next talk. <laughs>